problems, right? We all have problems. Every one of us here this morning has had a problem. And you're probably or very likely in a problem right now. We don't know what that is, and you do, but we have all kinds of problems. We have relational problems. And if you don't, you're going to. You're just going to. If you're in a family, then you've had relational problems. Uh, if you are working, then you've had problems at work, or you will. It's just a matter of time. It happens. If you're just basically doing any kind of labor, you have problems. Because nothing, and I mean nothing, goes as planned, right? I mean, you could have the best laid out plan to, to do whatever it is you're doing, and ultimately something's going to go wrong. We used to call it Murphy's Law, right? If it's going to go wrong, it will. And it seems to, especially as you're fixing up a home or, or doing something like that, that has been, stood around uh, the age of uh, ages, ages, it seems, uh, or a simple project never is a simple project. There's always something else you have to do. We were putting a, a bathroom fan because we needed it. And I thought it would be a no big deal. So I thought, well, that's something I've done in the past. So I'm going to do it again. Yeah, no big deal. So as soon as I get up in the attic, I realize, oh, great. There's not only this ceiling, there's another ceiling underneath that. And so it's never as you go. There's always something else that makes it harder. And then you have to think through, okay, should I do this or should I be calling someone else to do this? Nothing goes. We have problems. Every aspect of life. And sometimes, maybe I should say oftentimes, they come in waves. You feel that? It's like you could be going along and then bang. It's like, what's going on? We would say that when it rains, it pours. It's like, okay, I can handle one, but now this? And then now that? And then you say, well, when's it going to end? We, they come in waves. And sometimes we even feel like, I, I can't ever get a break. My own life and the things that are going on around, you just feel like, man, there's something always going wrong. And if you find yourself in that situation this morning or recently coming through that or maybe you're worried that's going to happen, well, be of good cheer because we all go through it. James knows that. The Holy Spirit obviously knows that. We're human. That's how life goes. Life is full of sorrow. And life is not only filled with just basic sorrow, it's filled with personal sorrow. And then you add to that recipe, not just human sorrow, but we're Christians. At least we claim to be. And Scripture makes a big deal out of bearing one another's sorrows. <laughs> so wait a minute. I have to go through my sorrow and my problems, and I'm actually supposed to care about yours? <laughs> Which means I'm supposed to get involved? At least pray for you? Which means I probably should have an informed prayer? <laughs> Which means I should probably ask some questions as to what it is you're going through? And most of the time we don't even do that because I've got, my own, I've got so many problems myself, I, I don't even pray enough for those. So very quickly, we get overwhelmed, even though we don't think we're overwhelmed. Oftentimes, we find ourselves overwhelmed very quickly. What do we do? How do we weep with those who weep? How do we bear one another's burdens? How do I even bear my own? The, so this question comes, how do you cope with these disappointments? And how do we cope with these frightening disappointments? These devastating personal disappointments that you haven't even told anybody. But down deep you feel them. The relationship isn't what you thought it was going to be. It doesn't bring the fulfillment you had hoped it was going to have. The thing that you wanted so badly really isn't satisfying. You can't share that with anyone because you'd be ashamed of that or fearful of those things. I, I wanted to help. I thought I would be a good helper, but down deep, I'm, I'm growing tired of helping. Personal things that we don't even share with anybody. Well, let's turn to James. 
James chapter 1. Let me just read our text. We're, we're not going to get through it all this morning. I don't even know how far we're going to get. It's a little scary being up here not knowing how far we're going to get. But we're going to keep going. Let me read it though so at least we have our text before us this morning. Let's pick it up in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. A wonderfully instructive section of Scripture. Just reading it, you know there's important truth here. You know that. And the last verse, verse 12 there, really is the summation of the whole section. It really is. It's the promise. It's, a, it's, it's almost a beatitude. It's a blessing, Blessed is the man, that's generic, of course, who remains steadfast under trial. That's the point. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. It's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. And what's the point? Trials produce Blessing, And we've got to say that from the very get-go, from the very beginning, so that we keep this in our context, so that we know where we're going. Because so often we get fixated on the trial, on the testing, on the struggle. We forget what it is doing in us. And we have to be reminded. The Holy Spirit using James to remind us. Trials produce blessing. We start in trouble. Verse 2, count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, yet you end in blessing. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under the trial. So how do we turn our trouble into blessing? That would be good to know. That's the issue here. And that's what we're going to discuss as we go through this passage, no doubt, this morning and even into next week, Lord willing. Last week I gave you an illustration, or at least I read to you a letter from a young man who was a bit perturbed that his fiance was upset with him that he didn't give her a real diamond, a man-made diamond. He thought they were the same thing. What's the big deal? Well, I read a little bit more in regards to that, and a jeweler, uh, in order to determine a real genuine diamond, and diamonds are a good example because they're so often counterfeited, a jeweler gives as one of the surest tests in determining what a diamond is, if it's true, if it's authentic or genuine, versus man-made or, or a fake, complete fake, is what's known as the water test. Have you heard this? You know this? Have you tried this? Not sure if you've ever seen them do it. I, I haven't. Um, but an imitation stone is apparently on the surface as brilliant as a real stone. And that's clear when you look at, at it in its case. Of course, to an untrained eye, it's very hard to see the difference between a real diamond and a man-made diamond. But there's something called this water test where the jeweler will 
put the diamond underwater and the genuine diamond sparkles just as if it's not in the water. Light still passes through the diamond and it sparkles literally in the water. But you put a man-made diamond underwater, and try this when you get home, I guess, uh, it, it will not sparkle. It's clouded. There's no light that passes through. And so I guess it's a sure test for a diamond. Maybe things have changed with some of these more advanced man-made diamonds like we read about last week. But that's always been a general test and a sure test of, of genuine authenticness. And for many of us who are confident of our faith on the surface, when things are going well, and we believe we're Christian, and we do our thing, and we feel like we're good with the Lord, we're doing fine. But when you're underneath the water of the trial, do we still sparkle? And this is James' desire for us. There's not a lot of virtue. There's not a lot of good for us running around claiming we're Christians. And then when a trial hits, you act just like the world. I'll never forget the years when I worked in the cosmetic industry. I was at a counter, and one very outspoken woman who was, uh, said she was a Christian. She was the manager of the Chanel booth, and she would go on and on all the time. Everyone knew she was a Christian. And yet it was her that when she came up under trial, had one of the foulest mouths of the department. Well, what's wrong there? What's wrong there? What, what do trials indicate in our life? And James, the Holy, and the Holy Spirit, through James, I should say, is going to tell us the trials are going to test what's actually there. And that's the point. That's the point that we have before us. James, obviously, concerned with these matters. Verse 3, he says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, Putting your faith to the test is, is an aspect, is a critical aspect of being a Christian even. It reveals our strength or it reveals our weakness, the weakness of our faith. And life is filled with these tests and we all know that. I think of Job. And we're going to talk a lot about Job during this study. Job chapter 5 verse 7 he says this, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. What does that mean? Well, if you're breathing, you're going to have problems. <laughs> if a fire is burning, then there's going to be sparks that go up. That's the point. It's just going to happen. Job 14, verse 1, he says, man that is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. And we would echo amen. Amen. The writer of Ecclesiastes seems to be a little sour on life at times, doesn't he? He says this in verse 17, So I hated life. Have you ever hated life? I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. And none of it matters. Verse 23, he goes on, All his days man's task is painful and grievous. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is emptiness. It's easy to feel like life is vain when you can't feel like you can get ahead. Life can seem filled with nothing but trouble and emptiness. And even for us as Christians those belonging to God, who for the most part, those of us here in this room, have been raised in a culture and in a climate here in America where you've heard more about Jesus is going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise than Jesus is going to give you more struggles. Most of us have been raised with a theology of come to Jesus, He'll do this and this and this for you. In fact, probably most of us heard the gospel through someone saying, come to Jesus, he'll fill the void in your life. Well, isn't that wonderful? What else can Jesus do for me? It's a man-centered, man-sucking religion that most of us have believed. And it's a bad one. 
is a false one. Is it any wonder we fall apart when trials come, let alone two or three or four or five all at the same time? So again, we need an examination manual. Paul tells us that even in marriage, and of course, he wouldn't have to write this for us to know that, but even in marriage, there's trouble. 1 Corinthians 7.28, Paul calls it a worldly trouble because you find yourself preoccupied with what your spouse wants versus what God wants. Why? Because you don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> you, you, want you want to have a relationship that you can have peace in. No trouble is as painful as that which occurs when family is involved. The closer you are to people, that is your spouse, your children, your parents, grandchildren, relative, father, a mother, the closer the relationship, the more pain is inflicted when they're in sorrow or you're in sorrow through the relationship, disappointment, death. Jesus said, in the world, you are going to have tribulation. It just goes with life. And so we need to expect it. And I, I, I'm drawing this out, obviously, because we live as though it shouldn't be happening. We get upset with God when we go through trials. And that only betrays the thought that I shouldn't have trials. But brothers and sisters, listen, if you're alive and if you're a Christian, you're going to have multiple struggles. And because you're a Christian doesn't mean any of them are going to get solved now. And that, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but I do mean to be the bearer of reality. It's so crucial. Even Christ himself went through nothing but trials. James tells us here that trouble, listen, James is telling us that trouble, the trouble that you're going through or that we will go through is a test. The troubles you go through are a test. It's a test. Verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Your trouble, your trials are a test, which God has promised to those who love him. If you pass those tests, if you persevere through that test, you'll be blessed and receive the crown of life, James says. And so we need to have a perspective here that might be a paradigm shift for some of us, but that our, our, our trouble is our testing, is our testing. And that's absolutely key to this opening section of the book of James. Now notice verse 2. James understands that trouble comes in many forms. He says it. When you encounter, he says, various Various kinds or various trials. It's an important word. It, it, it's a word that means many colored, multiple kinds of trouble. It emphasizes not a number. Listen, it, it, it's not talking about a number, it's talking about variety. There's a difference. Sometimes we go through troubles that aren't from the Lord. I brought them on myself. I don't need to blame God for that. Now, he's allowed it to happen. Yes, he knew it was going to happen, of course. But I did that. I can count that one on my own, thank you. But there's tests that come in all varieties. This is what this means. When you encounter various or a, or a variety, diversity, that's a big word today, it comes in all kinds of ways, in relationships, in monetary things, in physical things, in mental things, in social things, in health things. You're going to experience trials in all of these things. We don't know exactly what the troubles were from those that James is writing to. We don't necessarily know that. We know that they're scattered abroad, so we know that they've experienced a form of persecution. We know that. History tells us they were persecuted, so they were certainly dealing with that. We can allude to some of what James writes later on in the epistle here. Some of them were not getting paid for what they were doing. They were taken greatly advantage of. Lots of injustice, a lot of unfairness. That's a trial. 
Some of the ones that he is writing to, he alludes, there, there's some hostility towards those who are rich and the poor. There's, there's prejudice going on in the churches and, and among the Christians. So we, we know that's a form of trial all over the place. There are all kinds of ways in which life is exposed here to trial and trouble, and James, of course, knows that. And so the question always comes back down to, well, how are we going to deal with it? How are we going to deal with it? James doesn't even distinguish between internal trouble and external trouble. Trouble comes in both forms. Some of our most profound trouble has nothing to do with anybody else, right? We alluded to that. It deals with our personal disappointments, our deep-seated personal unfulfillments that you thought things were going to be different by now. A love that never really transpired, fears and worries that don't seem to subside, frustrations and cares, dreams that were never realized, expectations that are still going unmet, loneliness, loss that you haven't gotten over yet, whatever, they're all there. And then you've got the external things, the criticism, the persecutions, the misunderstandings, the conflicts, the lies. This is all life. And so James says, how we react is what's important. The trials aren't going to go away. But how we react is a test. And it is a test of our faith. Hopefully we remember from last week what we shared, that the genuineness of something The genuineness of something valuable is affirmed through a process of examining and of testing. And that's where we go as we continue here in this. We go through the trial. If we do it and we stand the test of time, then certainly we will receive a promise from none other than our Lord, the crown of life. And this is where the Lord wants us to get to. This is where he wants us to get to. So as we realize that, we have to focus on that. And the purpose of trials in life is so that we know, God knows, the purpose for trial in life is so that you and I know. God already knows. God does not need to be informed about anything. So the purpose of the trials of life is so that you may know Ultimately, the strength or the weakness of your faith. And if your your faith is strong, then there's an encouragement and a comfort there. If we find our strength is weak, then we have a command from the Lord, button it up. You got to shore it up. You got to shore it up. And this is what we have, again, to look forward to. God is intentioned then through trials to ultimately get us to eternal blessing. And only he could do that. How do we endure these trials to the end so that we receive the blessing? All right? How do we endure the trial so that we can get to the blessing? Well, James is going to give us a few points here. We're not going to get through them all this morning. Maybe just one. Maybe two. Maybe just one. But let's at least touch on that one, shall we? And the first thing he's going to tell us here is we need to cultivate during our trials, during the trial, while you're in the testing. We need to cultivate in the midst of the testing a joyous attitude, a joyful countenance. Now this is stunning because we don't think this way and no matter how much we've been informed biblically we, between the difference between happiness and joy, we still, for the most part, live with our compass pointed towards happiness. We know joy is a biblical concept, far more mature. We know joy is not based around, uh, on circumstances, but on a someone. Happiness is based on circumstances, not someone. If, unless we see that someone as a circumstance. But we focus our lives on happiness. And so we're happy and, and glad and things are, I can handle it as long as I'm happy. 
But when that is ripped from me, then all of a sudden I can get nasty really quick. In fact, sometimes I'm surprised what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> right? So we need to cultivate, in the midst of trial, a joyous attitude. And James here begins, in verse 2, count it all joy. And the first thing I want to point to you is count it all joy is an imperative. It's a command. Now, how can you command someone to have joy? How can you command someone to have joy? You can't do that, can you? Well, you can when you understand joy. And it's not based upon circumstances. Joy is based upon, of course, someone. My brothers, he, he loves that phrase. We saw that last week 15 times here in this epistle. He uses it nearly 19 times in the form of the word. So he, he's speaking to fellow Christians here, those who, who he's writing to. And so this is for a Christian, and that's why he can command it. You can't command an unbeliever to have joy because they don't even know what it is. They're still equating it with happiness. They're still equating it to themselves. Only the believer can truly equate joy with God. The modern American Christian, that jargon says that you become a Christian, you ought to be free from trouble, as we've already alluded to. And if your faith was just strong enough, you won't have problems. I'll never forget when we owned the Christian bookstore there in Northampton years ago, when an individual came in and she was looking for a book. And on, uh, I don't even remember the particular book, but I, I recommended a book by Johnny Erickson Tata. And she looked at me, she goes, I'll never read a book that she's ever written. I said, why? She's amazing. Now, what do I don't know? And she said, because she doesn't have enough faith to get over her wheelchair. Oh my God. And I said, are you kidding me? And after I picked my, my, myself up off the floor, I left. I realized I, I'm not going to be able to help this lady. Someone with that kind of a mindset that had been taught that kind of error is in a, is in a, bad, in a bad place. That is a, that's heretical. It's a lie. It's a lie. And that's what so much of us have heard or read to some capacity. And it has had its impact on us, as we've alluded. James knows better than that. He's given us a once-for-all command. The voice of the verb means you need to make a conscious commitment. This is what he's saying. You need to make a conscious commitment. Make a decision, is what he's saying. That's what the word means. Make a volitional choice to do this. Not going to be easy, but you've got to make a decision. You can't keep flip-flopping. He's going to talk about that in a minute. Those who flip-flop are double-minded men, unstable in all their ways, like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed to and fro. Let not that man think he, anything should be given to him. Why? He's an unstable man. Nothing's going to happen. He, he's flip-flopping all over the place. Make a decision. This is the command. And what's the decision, James? Count it all joy. Consider it good. Consider it something that God is doing in your life to make you more like Him, to test your faith so that you can receive an eternal reward. How else are you going to get an eternal reward? You think you're just going to get that simply because you're so great? Doesn't work that way. This once and for all command. You need to make a conscious commitment at some point. Same kind of verb is used in Matthew chapter 10, verse 12, where Jesus told his disciples, as you enter the house, greet it. You say, well, what does that have to do with this? Other than nothing other than the fact of how that verb is supposed to be interpreted. Jesus is telling his disciples as they go out to witness two by two, when you go into a house, greet it. So what was the first thing they should have done when they went into a house? Greet it. Why? Because I was told to do that. That's what I do. That's the first step. You make it, you make it, this is what I do. So that's the verb here. Matthew 27, verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can, talking about the tomb. The word secure, 
So what were they supposed to do? They're going to go make it as secure as they possibly can. That didn't mean that they're just going to talk about it and think about ways to do it. They're going to go do it. And they did. And it had no effect. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So count it is a very important word for us. If you really think about something, process what it is that's happening, you become not only to understand of what it has by way of an effect on you, but how it's going to lead you. When you know something you have to do, you prepare for it. <laughs> and then you think of ways you're going to do it. Right? If any of you were to be told next Sunday you're going to give the sermon. So what are you going to do during the week? I don't think you'll wait till Saturday night. At least I hope you won't. You prepare for that because you know it's coming. Whatever it is, that would be a likable illustration to that. You understand? You think forward is what he's saying. Think forward. So think forward, my brothers. For the sake of your, your joy. Whenever you encounter the various trials of life, whenever that happens, he's saying, brothers and sisters, think forward. Think forward. Don't get stuck on the trial. Think about what is taking place through the trial, and you're never going to do that unless you're prepared before it happens. This is where our volition, our will has to be engaged. This is why we need one another. That's why we need faithful brothers and sisters in our lives who are actually willing to tell us this. Because if we don't have someone telling us this, we will sink into our own pity parties very quickly. We all do. We all do. Not just in a case of death or in the case of illness. Instead of getting wrapped up in death or illness or sadness of whatever it might be, health, relationships, I begin to think forward. What? What is God producing through the trial? Paul could think beyond his own pain so much that he could say, when I, I'm suffered, I'm receiving the comfort of God in my suffering so that having learned that, I'll be able to comfort you. That's mature thought. Imagine that, thinking the, the trial I'm going through, the struggle that is beginning to consume me, I'm going to be able to Encourage someone eventually through this. And going through the frustration of loss and going through the unfulfilled dreams, having my goals never achieved, not getting the job I wanted, the education I wanted, the position I want, not getting what I want in my marriage, not getting what I want in my family. I still choose that in the midst of that to understand that during this, during this suffering, God is still at work. He's burning away pride. Maybe he's reforming my rebellion. He's refining me. Somehow he's making me more like his Savior. That's looking forward. That's seeing the picture. That's what it means to count. Consider it, brothers and sisters. So when you meet all kinds of different, various, diverse kinds of trials, he says. How can we forget Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, where the Lord chastens us for the moment we feel like it's grievous. But the writer of Hebrews says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. And yet if all you do is look at the moment, you're going to get stuck there. <laughs> he tells us to keep going. Yet to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The peaceful fruit of righteousness. Doesn't that sound good? Jesus is used as an illustration before that in Hebrews 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured what? The cross despising the shame that was set down at the right hand of God, the throne of God. So Christ was in the same situation. The agony on the cross, obviously inexplicable. We could never understand that. And yet it was for the joy that was set before him. Why? Because he knew what he was doing forward. 
What's our take home for at least this morning? Brothers and sisters, remember that during the test, there is, a, there is something being produced for the future. Your troubles are a test to examine your faith. And where is your faith? And the whole point that James starts here is because there's a lot of people running around saying that they're a faith. And it's not going to help you if that's not real. Note this. James doesn't say, I want you to have a little bit of joy here in the midst of your troubles. Does he? That's not what he says. What does he say? Count it all joy. No, I want you to be joyful. I want, I want you to experience joy. You say, well, what do you mean, James? I want you to have a, a, a focused, decisive commitment or conviction to face the trials as a source of unmixed joy. That means complete comprehensive, in totality. You say, this is way beyond where I can do. It is on your own. But now enters the faith point. Where's your faith? Is your faith on you or is your faith on God? And it reveals where you're at. See, that's the test. It reveals who you're putting your faith in. If all you do is struggle and stumble through every trial, it shows your faith is in you and your ability to get through it. But when we can go through the trials and have all joy, what he's telling us is that will reflect that your faith is in God and it's genuine. And not only is it genuine, there's going to be a reward that comes with that faith. Hang on. Hang on. And there we go back to Job. You know the story of Job, don't you? You remember the story of Job. Satan comes before God and he says, I want Job because you've given him everything. He has too perfect of a life. Imagine that. Okay, fine, you can have him. Just can't kill him. You can see Satan rubbing his hands and zipping off. And what does he do? Well, he does the unthinkable. None of us have struggled like Job. I don't know what you've been through, but I know it hasn't been what Job went through as quickly as Job went through it. I think one of the reasons Job is in the Bible is because of the intensity of the suffering that we see there in that one individual in that one moment of time. I'm not saying you haven't experienced loss. I haven't, I'm not saying that you haven't had relational issues and, and, and death in the families, but I doubt that you lost everything within the week. And it was none of your fault. <laughs> we know that about Job. It wasn't Job's fault. Well, go after Job. You can have him. So Satan goes after him. And what does Job say in the middle of the book? Well, he says a lot of things. But listen to Job 23.10. He comes to this moment, despite all the pontification of his friends, whom the Lord rebukes. He says this in Job 23.10. But he knows the way I take. Who's that? God does. God knows. He knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth. Can you finish it? As gold. In the midst of all this, Job fixes his eyes on the Lord and he knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. That has got to be a, a level of encouragement for us. We think we're in trouble. We haven't lost everything that Job himself has lost. And when we think forward, we get our eyes fixed upon the one who is at work in us through the trials, then it can change the status of our countenance during the trial. So count it all joy, my brothers and my sisters, when you meet trials of all various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith will produce patience, steadfastness, long-suffering. All those words mean the same. And let steadfastness have its full effect. What's that, James? 
that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The first thing that James is going to teach us here is that during the midst of our trials, we need to have a mindset of joy. That joy isn't human. That joy is fixated on a person. And that's why we can count it joy. And it is the first step of understanding why we're going through a problem. We see what God is at work. And I will put my trust and we will put our hope in the Lord. Let's, let's bow in prayer. And Father, we uh, thank you for just the, uh, the introductory gleaning here this morning from this wonderful section of Scripture. We know it's so profound, and we thank you so much for the truth that's here. We confess it, it's a hard pill. It's, it's hard medicine. We're not wired this way, Father, and you know that. It's not easy for us to be thankful for problems, especially when they seem to stack on top of one another. And yet, we want to trust you. We want to be those who can count it joy. Not just joyful, but all joy. And we know that we need you for that. So in the midst of our trials, in the midst of the difficulties of life, oh, help us to fix our eyes upon you. Understanding that it will take a purposeful decision to remember that you are at work here and you're about something great. You're about something that ultimately has a promise that involves a crown of life. How gracious are you that even in humanity's struggles, you still have a blessing attached in the future. By faith, we believe that this is true. And we claim it in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand?